Now we get to chapter 41. Here's, we don't know exactly how long Joseph was in prison before the cupbearer and the baker had their dreams. But we know that Joseph was in prison at least two years and more because it was two years after he interpreted the dream of the cupbearer and the baker that Pharaoh had a dream. And in Pharaoh's dream, verse 2, Pharaoh was standing by the Nile River and there were seven cows there who were very well nourished and fat and they were eating the grass. And then, verse 3, seven other cows came up after them from the Nile River and they were ugly and skinny and unwell. And they stood by the other cows on the bank of the Nile River. And then uh, something really horrifying happened. The ugly, skinny cows ate up the healthy, fat cows. And then Pharaoh woke up. Then he went back to sleep and he had another dream. And there, was, there were seven ears of, of grain which came up on a single stalk and they were healthy. And then there were seven ears of grain which were not healthy. They were thin and they were scorched. And the thin, ugly grain ate up the healthy, full grain. And then Pharaoh woke up. And in verse 8, it says that the dream bothered him. Have you ever had a dream which bothered you, which disturbed you? Pharaoh's dreams disturbed him. And so he calls the magicians. He calls his holy men. He calls his priests and his men who can work magic and who can interpret dreams. But there's no one who could interpret these dreams for him. And it was at that moment, after two years, that the cupbearer remembered. Can you imagine what it's like to remember something that you were supposed to do two years ago? The cupbearer remembers. And so the cupbearer said to Pharaoh, I know somebody who can interpret dreams. You were angry with me and you put me in prison along with the baker. Verse 11, we had a dream on the same night, he and I. Each of us dreamed according to the interpretation of his own dream. Now a Hebrew youth was with us there, a servant of the captain of the bodyguard, and we related to him, and he interpreted our dreams for us. To each one he interpreted according to his own dream. And just as he interpreted for us, so it happened that he restored me. You actually restored me in my office, but you hanged the baker. Then Pharaoh sent and called for Joseph, and he hurriedly brought him out of the dungeon. And when he'd shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came to Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, but no one can interpret it. I've heard about you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Joseph then answered Pharaoh, saying, Okay, what are you going to say if you're Joseph? What has the interpretation of dreams gotten for you? Well, it got you hated by your brothers. You lost your father. You lost your family. You lost your country. You lost your freedom. You became a slave. Then in trying to serve this God who gave you the gift of dreams, you were put in prison and falsely accused. You received the reputation of a rapist by resisting rape. And then you accurately interpreted the dreams of the baker and the cupbearer and you were forgotten. And you stayed in prison two 
more years. Now there's another dream. What are you going to do now? Every time you do this, something bad happens. And now the stakes are higher because this is Pharaoh. He can kill you. He's already killed the baker. He can kill anybody he wants to for any reason he wants to, just because he has a bad experience with them, because he's the king, he's the ruler of the country, he's the pharaoh. Now what are you going to do? Are you going to say, no thanks, I don't think I'm going to do that this time. It hasn't really worked out for me before, so thank you, but that's okay. Is that what you're going to say? We have a word in English, it's, it's the word buoyant. Buoyant means like a cork, like that cork which keeps coming up. Buoyant means you stay on top. There's something about Joseph. He's buoyant. You simply can't get him down. No matter what happens, he's happy. No matter what happens, he's confident. One bad thing happens. He's confident. Then another bad thing. Then another bad thing. Then another bad thing. Then another thing. bad thing. He still trusts God. He still loves God. The bad things that happen to him on the outside do not kill his love for God on the inside. You know why? Because God is with him. Because his relationship with God is a good thing. A thing that satisfies him. A thing that he enjoys even though all the outward circumstances of his life are causing him to suffer. And so what is the answer he gives? Joseph then answered Pharaoh saying, verse 16, It is not in me. God will answer Pharaoh. And the answer will be favorable. We have come to that place in the book of Genesis where Joseph stands before Pharaoh because Pharaoh has had a dream which he doesn't understand and only Joseph can tell him the meaning of a dream. Now, it's very important that we spend time asking ourselves this question. What is the point of our lives? Why have we been set on this planet? I think it's a very easy thing to do and a very human thing to do to conclude that we're on this planet to have pleasure. And so we devote most of the energy of our life to getting all the pleasure that we can and avoiding all the suffering that we can. And then when we have suffering in our life and we don't have pleasure, we view our lives as a tragedy, a failure, a mistake. And maybe we don't say this, but deep down we have the attitude that God has somehow botched it. God has blown it. God has not done a very good job with us, with our lives. And we struggle with this question of whether we should even trust God because our lives have been so difficult. Few people who've ever lived would have had more reason to think that way than Joseph. Surely all the pleasure had been taken from his life and his life was full of, of sorrow and suffering. Nothing seemed to turn out right. Even though nobody in the world was being faithful to God, was doing God's will more consistently than this excellent son of Jacob called Joseph. Maybe we should look at our lives in a different way. Maybe we should come to terms with this reality. We know God and most of the world doesn't. And even though the world doesn't know God, the world has dreams and they don't know what the dreams mean. And they're not going to learn what the dreams mean until they get to know God. So maybe, maybe the great key to purpose in life is not the avoidance of difficulty, not the avoidance of suffering, 
but to get ourselves to a place where we can explain to unbelievers what their lives mean, what their dreams mean, and who God really is. Now, we know from the text that Joseph had suffered from, for 13 years because when the story begins in chapter 37, he's, he's 17 years old. By the time he stands in the presence of Pharaoh, he's 30 years old. And that 13 years had been full of unbelievable suffering. I'll just tell you, take it from somebody who's almost 60 years old, that the time when you usually have the most fun is when you're in your 20s. And Joseph had that time, those 10 years, stolen from him. And then instead of having a wonderful time in his 20s, he had a terrible time in his 20s. And yet he remained faithful to the Lord. He waited on the Lord. Now, we may think we have to wait too long, but again, we have to ask ourselves this question. Do we really expect the eternal God to jump onto our schedule, to jump onto our calendar? God is working in and from and for eternity. We cannot cram the infinite and eternal God into our schedule, the little book where we decide what we're going to do on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday. God is the eternal God. He is working His purposes. He will achieve His purposes. And He, beg he begins to achieve His purposes in Joseph's life. Now, we already talked about the dream or the dreams which Pharaoh had. Joseph is summoned up from prison. He's washed up, he's cleaned up, he's shaved up, his hair is combed, and he appears before Pharaoh, and Pharaoh relates the dreams to him. And, and Joseph says to Pharaoh, this is Genesis 41, 25. Joseph said to Pharaoh, Pharaoh's dreams are one in the same. In other words, both dreams mean the same thing. God has told Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good ears of grain are seven years. The dreams are the same. The seven lean and ugly cows that came up after them are seven years. The seven thin ears coursed by the east wind, scorched by the east wind will be seven years of famine. It is as I have spoken to Pharaoh. God has shown to Pharaoh. He keeps God in the middle of it. He's not taking credit. He's giving all the credit to God. God has shown to Pharaoh what he is about to do. Seven years of great abundance. After that, seven years of famine. So the abundance will be unknown in the land because of the subsequent famine, verse 31, for it will be very severe. Now, as for the repeating of the dream to Pharaoh twice, it means that the matter is determined by God and God will quickly bring it about. Now, let Pharaoh look for a man discerning and wise and, let him, and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh take action to appoint overseers in charge of the land. Let him exact a fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt in the seven years of abundance. In other words, when there's an abundant save for the years when we don't have much. Verse 36, let the food become a reserve for the land for the seven years of famine. Verse 37, now the proposal seemed good to Pharaoh and all his servants. Now look at verse 38. Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find a man like this in whom is a divine spirit? So Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has informed you of all this, there is no one so discerning and wise as you are. You have to remember that the Egyptians worshipped millions of gods. Gods with a little g, little godlets, little miniature gods who had little jobs because they were little gods. Now he's speaking of one god, a big g, a god who is alone and in control of everything. You shall be over my house, and according to your command, all my people shall do homage. First, he was over the command, over the house of Potiphar. He was rejected from his own house. He was put over the house of Potiphar. Then he was put over the prison. 
Now he's put over the house of Pharaoh. He's put over the whole country. It's amazing. Pharaoh said to Joseph, this is chapter 41, verse 41, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Remember how Tamar, disguised as a prostitute, took the seal from um, her father-in-law Judah and the cord around his neck and the staff. And Judah gave these emblems to a woman he believed to be a prostitute. Now Pharaoh gives his emblems publicly to Joseph. Pharaoh took the signet ring from his hand, put it on Joseph, clothed Joseph in garments of fine linen, and put the gold necklace around his neck. See, Judah had been carrying that signet, that seal, to show who he was, his signature around his neck. He took the cord off his neck and gave it to Tamar. Tamar. That's what happened in chapter 38. Now in chapter 41, Pharaoh takes the gold uh, necklace from around his neck and puts it on Joseph. You see what's happened? It's amazing. Verse 43, he had him ride to his second chariot, in his second chariot. And they proclaimed before Joseph, bow the knee. Then he set him over all the land of Egypt. Okay, now stop and listen. Here we have the story of someone deep in the Old Testament. Someone who lived over 3,500 years before Jesus was born in Bethlehem. It's the very first book of the Bible. What has happened to this man? Well, he was rejected by his brothers because he was the favorite of his father. His father loved him, but his brothers hated him. His brothers throw him into the, a pit of death, but he comes out of the pit alive. But his brothers tell a lie about him. They say that he's dead. They know that he's alive, but they say that he's dead. The message that he gave to his family, his brothers, the interpretation of the dream about who he was and that he would be exalted was rejected. It was rejected by the Jews. But his message is believed by the Gentiles. Now, his message to the Gentiles is a message of salvation. Joseph tells them how they can stay alive, even though everybody else is going to die because they don't have food. So he has a message of salvation based on the interpretation of the dreams, which is rejected by his brethren, the Jews, but is accepted by the Gentiles. The Gentiles accept the message of salvation before the Jews accept the message of salvation. And in Egypt among the Gentiles, he is lifted up to the throne to the right hand of Pharaoh in the right hand chariot next to Pharaoh. And by the way, in the next verses, he's given a Gentile wife. Who does this sound like? Do you think it's just a coincidence? This is the story of Jesus of Nazareth. This is the exact same pattern that we see in Jesus' life. He was rejected by his brothers. He was thrown into a pit of death. He came out of the pit alive. The Jews lied and said that the disciples stole his body. They lied and said he's still dead. The Gentiles accept the message of salvation. The Jews reject it. The Gentiles are saved. Jesus takes a Gentile wife, the church. It can't be an accident. It can't be a coincidence. There are too many details. 
Whenever I have the opportunity to talk to a Jew, I always say, if I cannot prove that Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah of Israel and the Son of God from the Old Testament, then you don't need to listen to anything I say. I won't even look at any verses in the New Testament. Let's just look in the Old Testament and see what we discover. And so we see in the amazing career of this man called Joseph, a perfect pattern of our Savior, Jesus. In this pattern, I think we have hope that one day the Jews will know that they're starving and they're going to die. And the only way they can live is to apply to this rejected brother, even though they don't know who he is. And it gives me hope, as does other passages, as do other passages in the New Testament give me hope that one day there will be a national repentance, a national turning, a national conversion on part of the Jews, and that Israel will turn and believe and receive Jesus of Nazareth as their Messiah and as their Savior. But now we have the years of rejection, and the brothers don't know. They don't know where he is. They sold him into slavery. While we continue being a benevolent project, your kind donations will continue to be vital in fulfilling the calling of TVS ministry. We do count on your gracious support and cooperation. For detailed information, please visit tvsseminary.com. Um, verse 43 says that when Joseph went anywhere in Egypt, the announcement was made, bow the knee. Everyone was bowing before Joseph. It says in verse 46, Genesis 41, 46. Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went through all the land of Egypt. During the seven years of plenty, the land brought forth abundantly. So he gathered all the food of these seven years, which occurred in the land of Egypt, and placed the food in the cities. He placed in every city the food from its own surrounding fields. Thus Joseph stored up grain in great abundance like the sand of the sea until he stopped measuring it, for it was beyond measure. We're told in verses 50 to 52 how, how Pharaoh gave Joseph a wife, the daughter of a priest. It would have been a pagan priest. And... Um, Joseph was given two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, through this Egyptian woman. Now, um, let me just say that the salvation that the Egyptians believed in through Joseph's plan was a secular salvation. It was a physical salvation. It was not a spiritual salvation. What I'm saying is this, pitch, this pattern of physical salvation is a picture of the spiritual salvation which we have in Jesus. I'm not saying it's the exact same thing. I'm saying it is the same pattern. We ask the question, did the Pharaoh who recognized the divine spirit in Joseph, did he become a believer? Will we see him in heaven? Did Joseph's wife, who gave him two sons, did she become a believer? Will we see her in heaven? Did her father, the pagan priest of Egypt, did he become a believer? Will we see him in heaven? Let me just say this. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe. We're not told. I do think we have hope. I would think that any intelligent person who knew Joseph would ask the question, how can Joseph know these things? The reason is because he knows the one true God, the God above all gods. The other gods were not gods at all. They were false gods. In fact, they were demons. Whether Joseph said these things about the gods of Egypt, I don't know. Probably he did not. But I have to believe that as Joseph saved 
all the Egyptians physically, that he must have saved some of the Egyptians spiritually. We can have that hope. Now there's another thing that I wonder about that I don't know the answer to. What about Potiphar's wife? What did she think when Joseph became the ruler? She must have been very nervous because she knew the lies that she told about him and she knew the suffering that she caused him. And what about Potiphar? Joseph was probably too great a man, too noble a spirit to bother Potiphar and his wife or to give them any trouble. If Joseph had been a bad man, if Joseph had been a small man, it would have been terrible for Potiphar and his wife. And let me just say, if Joseph had been a man, a man like me, it would have been a little bit uncomfortable for Potiphar's wife because I would not have hurt her, but I would have scared her to death. I would have made her very nervous and I would have made her very fearful just to have a little fun with her for what she had done to me. But Joseph was a bigger man than that and he probably didn't even think about it, didn't even bother. But surely Potiphar and his wife must have thought, who is this God of Joseph who tells him the secrets of dreams? Who is this God of Joseph who exalts him on high? And who is this God of Joseph who's so full of grace and forgiveness that we don't have to worry about punishment and revenge? Well, one day when we'll get to heaven, we will learn who in Egypt was not only saved physically. Everybody in Egypt was saved physically because of Joseph. He is the Redeemer. He redeemed all of Egypt from starvation. He had a plan of salvation. And that plan was only possible because of his suffering. Thirteen years of suffering. Thirteen years of false accusation. Thirteen years of being punished for doing the right thing. If you and I are to succeed in the Christian life, we have to be willing to wait on a reward. If we insist on getting a reward right now, Christianity is not for us. Because the whole key to Christianity is being willing to wait for God to show what's right. That may not happen until the day we die. Hopefully it will happen before then. Hopefully we won't have to wait until the day we die. But Joseph had to wait 13 years. 13 years. And so we ask ourselves the question, how long do we give God? Do we give up on God after 13 days? Do we give up on God after 13 months? Do we give up on God after five years? Joseph waited 13 years, 13 years of being punishment, punished, 13 years of having his heart broken. And yet his confidence in God is high. He tells Pharaoh, God will show Pharaoh what he's about to do. He never lost his confidence in God. And even though interpreting dreams got him in trouble and got him forgotten, here he is interpreting dreams again. And now he's rewarded. And now he's exalted beside Pharaoh on the very throne of Egypt in the second chariot. This is the story of this incredible man named Joseph. Now it says in verse 56, that when the famine spread everywhere, then Joseph opened the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians. But then in verse 57, the people from the other countries began to come to the Egyptians. Now, 
Remember we started the story of Joseph in chapter 37. Then in chapter 38, we saw what was happening back at home in Canaan and the horrible, horrible tragedies and the moral squalor of Judah's family. The death of Judah's two brothers, the immorality of uh, the death of Judah's two sons, the immorality of Onan, and the fact that he struck dead the immorality of Judah who believes he is buying a prostitute when the woman is not a prostitute, the woman is his daughter-in-law. The conception of the twins, that's chapter 38. After chapter 38, we have remained in Egypt. We've been in Egypt in chapter 39, 40, and 41.